Hello YouTube and welcome to quite a long video. Today I'll do something new, something which probably not a lot of my regular viewers will watch, but something I've wanted to do for quite some time. Review some games, and by review I just mean sharing my general thoughts on them. And for some games I will discuss their value for the lore scholars among us, which is basically everybody who watches this channel. Which is basically why I think my reviews, if you can call them that at all, will add something of value as I will often specifically talk about how worth it is to explore the lore of a certain game or a certain series. Uh, by the way, this video has timestamps, so if you want to skip some things like this intro, because not all games have lore, so you might want to skip some games. For example, for a significant part of this review, I will be bitching about Mario Kart 8, so feel free to skip that if you're just for the lore. Now, two disclaimers. First of all, this is just a collection of most of what I've played this year, not some chronological list of this year's releases, because some games that I'm talking about here are going to be as old, and some of them I'm straight up playing for the second or third time this year, so regard this list as a collection of games that I either have praise for, or I have something to bitch about, or I just want to say something about with a mild focus on the lore value, if there is any. Second, I like my consoles, as I consistently have problems with any PC I've basically owned, so I had to use my shitty Chinese capture card to capture all my footage when it's there. So, if footage looks slightly stuttery or looks unnatural, it's because either the capture card does not function, or maybe the game has frame rate issues, because I did play some games on Switch. Now, final bit of information, most of the background footage here is spoiler free because story is often the reason that I play these games and, you know, I like to play my games completely blind even without any trailer information, so I have kept the background footage as spoiler free as I could for you guys, but I had to use some new game plus files here and there, so yeah, be warned, as some minor things might have just, you know, slipped through. Okay, so first up in January of 2022, I played a game that I've probably played a hundred times. And I've actually played it twice last year, as I played it again in May. It's Fire Emblem Three Houses on the Nintendo Switch. I know I'm committing blasphemy by saying this on a channel which is a shrine to everything Elder Scrolls, but this is probably my favorite game of all time, or at least up there. And I don't say that lightly. Now, for those of you who don't know what this game is all about, in short, you are a teacher at the Officers Academy, a place where nobles and rich commoner students from all three big nations of the continent of Fotland gather, which is the world where the game takes place. And they attend there to study to become more versed in combat and strategy, to become knights, leaders, generals, etc. Now, these nations all have their own class or houses at this very Hogwarts-like academy. Uh, you choose which class to teach and each class has their own storyline and an amazing set of unique characters. As a teacher myself, you see why I like this game, because you're a teacher. Anyway, so you play as a teacher of one of the three classes or houses and you teach the students, increasing their levels and stats for the turn-based strategy combat portions, which are also really good. Basically the exact kind of combat that I like in a game. Now, between the combat portions, there are the life sim portions where you are essentially interacting with your students and where the story unravels. During these portions, you can do all sorts of things to increase your bond with your students and their bonds with one another. You can then see these bonds deepen in so-called support conversations between them and with you. And as teacher, you can even kind of influence the stuff like who ends up romantically with each other in the end. Uh, in this game there are basically infinite possibilities, but it's not all an anime dating sim, because this game has an amazing story. There are several paths to the game that are linked to the three classes or houses of students which you teach. And as I said, each house has their own story and every house's story gives you only a certain amount of information about the plot and the continent and the entire history, which is all told through unreliable narrator. So while one house, which has a cool and satisfying story, as you discover something about the past which feels satisfying in the end to have learned, when you're done, you only learn in the other paths and that that event may have been part of a bigger narrative. I'm keeping it really vague because this game is so good when you experience it blind. Not knowing anything of the story is just the best way to experience this. Now, there's some really deep lore to dive into in order to find the truth about the full story as everything that is there is basically up for interpretation at all times. Uh, because what a character tells you is only his or her view, which is limited by how much knowledge they have of the world and sometimes they may just straight up be lying. Hints and bits about the story are hidden everywhere in dialogue. Uh, those support conversations that I talked about earlier, where you can view the bonds deep in between students, they often contain little bits about the lore. There are books around the academy and even combat dialogue. And if you like deep story and lore with unreliable narrators, just please give this game a try. You will not be sorry, I guarantee it. It is my favorite game for a reason. 
it's not flawless like I don't like the anime um, art style I know that it's there for a purpose and I know that a lot of people do like it I know I don't really like it I don't know if it would have worked with a realistic art style but that's beside the point because that's one of the only real negatives I have about the game um, the other negative is that it's clear that some house routes there were some cut corners to meet a deadline probably so they're not all as long as they should be and the DLC was not as good as I wanted it to be but still definitely not bad and yeah again the anime art style is not my favorite I would have liked a bit more western art style because I'm not too much of an anime fan but again I have no idea if it would even have worked in another art style because the art style does kind of work I'm, I'm just I'm, I'm just weird on this so I don't think I would change it in the end, I just tolerate the anime art style, but um, yeah, just in my opinion, try the game. I mean, there's a fishing winning game in it, so there's something for everybody. Now, next up, you know what made my 2022 an instantly okay year, even if there were no other games? Because there was a sequel to one of my favorite games of all time, you know, the one that we just talked about, Fire Emblem Three Houses. Because in June, we got the half sequel that nobody really asked for, but I'll gladly take it, Fire Emblem Warriors Three Hopes. This game is basically three houses again, except instead of strategy combat, we have this Dynasty Warriors gameplay. Now, I am not a Dynasty Warriors fan at all. I've tried different games, but I just never could into them. But this game was pretty good. The way they translated some of the mechanics of three houses, uh, which had strategy combat gameplay to warrior style gameplay, is really clever. And many of the quality of life improvements and the snappiness of the new UI really make this game feel like a proper sequel, even though it plays nothing like the first one. On top of that, it usually expands the lore of the world, as in they answer questions that we had after the first game and introduce more lore of the world. And they introduce even more lore mysteries. I don't really know how to describe it. I'm not an expert on this kind of stuff, despite doing this on YouTube for over six years now. But the way they did this here is an example of really good world building. For example, in the first game they named all these places and people that we don't get to really learn more about other than the fact that they exist and that they influence some people's lives. They did this to make the world feel real and not just contained to your gameplay. Like there's more outside of your perspective. And we can see this in action in this game. For example, in the first game, you don't see the brother of one of the characters from the first game, even though he influenced their lives immensely. And then in this game, you actually show us that brother and he is even there involved in the story. That was an amazing addition. And other than that, they just gave us more lore on places that we still don't visit. For example, we now know one or two things about continents that we first only saw on the map. But the thing is that while we know a little bit more now, they gave us a bit of a feel of the place, like what it's like there, because we didn't used to know that. But it opens up so many more lore questions and implications and it's just amazing as a lore person. I mean, you can't imagine how I felt to learn so much more about a world that I became so invested in, almost as invested as in the Elder Scrolls. And in terms of new stories, this game gives you three more stories in addition to the three and a half slash four stories of the first game. Uh, they play basically parallel to the other stories, except it plays uh, a bit differently. You sh should play it, I don't want to spoil anything. Basically, you explore three possible timelines in which the main character from the first game did not become a teacher at the academy and the new original player character that's introduced for this game becomes a student, so you experience the academy as a student. It shows just how influential the coming of the main character uh, as a teacher in the first game was and how different the fates of the people involved in the stories could have been. Now, these stories, they're different. And it's clear that the developers wanted them to be distinct and different from the stories of the first game, and they succeeded. Unfortunately, the stories, in my opinion, and in the opinion of most of the friends who have also played this game, do us not reach the heights of the stories of the first game. I feel like this is probably because they wanted the stories to be so different and not a carbon copy of the first game. And this unfortunately means that many of the meaningful story points of the first game cannot be reused and thus they need to think of new things to implement. Now, the problem is that the points of the first story were basically driven by aspects which made the characters interesting. So a lot of the points here felt a bit more boring as they did not come from the interesting places that they came from in the first game. I don't know if I worded that correctly, but it's the only way that I can really word it without spoiling anything. But still, the stories were pretty good. Not as good as the first game, but pretty good. And the new lore and the new original characters and the new interactions between the characters are amazing. 
And yeah, it's not a super perfect package due to the sometimes flawed stories, but still a very welcome game and definitely worth investing your time in if you want to know more about the story and lore of Fire Emblem Three Houses World. But still, play that game first, as this really is a sequel and they barely explain some of the basics of the world, which they do explain in the first game, so yeah, do play the first game. The story there is better too, so um, just go play it please, I need more people to care about these games and this world. Okay, next game. So last year in October, a Nintendo Switch port of Nier Automata was released and I decided to pick it up because this game is a game that I've always been interested in but I just never picked up. And well, it's good. I really liked it. The Switch port doesn't look as hot in the graphics department as the other console but it still runs really smoothly and I like that. The game has gotten a lot of great reviews and I get why. The combat is really good, although very hard to learn for me as there's a lot of different inputs. But once I got the hang of it after a few sessions I really liked it and I could not get enough of the game for a good few days, especially enjoying that sweet combat. I also really enjoyed the story and unraveling some of the game's mysteries. The lore in this game is quite good with the side quests often being very worth playing as you will discover more about the world and piece things together. It is quite deep and I can definitely recommend it. Although it does seem that there are some mysteries without satisfying answers here but that if that doesn't bother you you can just spend a good amount of time learning about Nier's world. Now to experience Nier Automata's story completely however you need to do several playthroughs to see all the sides of the story and get the full picture as other playthroughs are just a must for this game. Unfortunately after the first playthrough I just took a bit of a break from the game to play some other things and when I tried to get back in well as you can see in the footage here I completely lost all muscle memory in the combat which was so bad that I had to set the game to easy mode to even record this piece of gameplay for the video. I have the muscle memory and reaction time and hand eye coordination of a frying pan so I couldn't really get back into it and I just ended up watching an amazing recap of the entire story online which was several hours long and really well edited and really explained a lot. I'll have a link to that in the description of this video. So much effort went into that and it's a good way to experience the story once you get sick of the combat or like me have the gaming skills of a stapler. Still, a really good story, bit of a shame that the combat takes so long to learn for me personally, but after a bit of practice it's doable for me and for most people it's absolutely no problem. But still a bit of a shame that I got less gaming time out of this than I probably could have, but considering how great it was when I mastered it, definitely a good game, so don't let it stop you if you're like me and definitely give it a try if it sounds like your thing. With some patience this game can be really neat and definitely worth exploring it for the story. It's sort of post-apocalyptic and there's some interesting mysteries to unravel so definitely go for it. War is cool. Okay next game. You know story games aren't all that I play because over this year I played quite a lot of Mario Kart 8 Deluxe. I even played it against some of my students once at school which was quite a lot of fun to beat them and get crazy amounts of street cred. Now because of my bad muscle memory and reaction time I'm definitely not the best at this game that one can be but this ain't my first Mario Kart rodeo as I played quite a few games in the series and such I'm always quite decent and I've won quite a lot of online matches. I even tried my hand at time trials and got within 4 seconds of the world record at the time in a less than optimal meta card setup on one of the new DLC tracks, which for someone with my bad gaming skills and terrible reaction time, does feel like quite an achievement. That said, there's no lore in this game, I just wanted to share my thoughts on it because I think it's probably the best Mario Kart out there. While I have quite a soft spot for bar both Mario Kart Double Dash and DS, 8 Deluxe on Switch is just the most polished and fleshed out that Mario Kart's ever been and I love for and I just love it. The tracks are absolutely amazing in this game with most of them and the fact that they still add new tracks right now and I get them for free with my Switch Online membership is just amazing and it keeps pulling me back into this game from time to time. Definitely basically my favorite game just to pick up and play a few matches or train my muscle memory at time trials. You know, it's just fun, I can recommend it. But enough of this loreless Nintendo game, let's talk about another game, Horizon Forbidden West. Okay, so back in 2020 when I got my first PlayStation console, the PS4, yes I know, I was very late to the party. The very first game that I picked up was Horizon Zero Dawn. Now, this game had intrigued me ever since the launch and I just wanted to play it, so I picked it up immediately after I got my PlayStation 4 and I absolutely loved it. I grinded through it through the lockdown and all I can say is that it's definitely up there among some of my, you know, favorite games. It kept me engaged and focused the entire playthrough, so needless to say the fact that Horizon Forbidden West, a sequel, was coming out, that just put Horizon Forbidden West pretty high up on my hypo meter. I mean, 
it's a sequel to such a good game, so it has to be good. And it was. It was really good. But I found that for all its greatness, and trust me, it's a great game. I did find the story to be a bit draggy. I don't really know how to describe it. It was never bad. I never did not enjoy it, but I found that looking back on it, the story felt too long and a little bit less interesting to me than the first game. As was the world, to be honest. The first Horizon had this amazing open world world filled with different cultures and tribes with them all being interesting in their own way. Uh, you have very tribal people and then you have a tribe with a gigantic city and it's basically just a quite technologically advanced civilization. Uh, that city, I mean, it just had my jaw dropped on the base PS4. And I kind of just didn't have that wow feeling for Horizon Forbidden West. Everybody living in the Forbidden West all kind of feels the same to me, even if I do see that they are really different. I mean, a lot of creativity went into designing these people and the land just for them to be different. But still, it just kind of felt less interesting to me and it's hard to pinpoint why. Anyway, it is a great game and I do know that others did not feel the same way I did. So definitely pick it up if it seems interesting to you. At the very least, you will have a good time like me. And at best, you will love it to absolute bits like many others did. But you should really should start with Horizon Zero Dawn because that's the start of the story. And well, Forbidden West is just straight up a sequel. Now, in terms of lore, well, both the first game and this game have quite a deep backstory to explore and there are recordings and data points all around the world that have you learn about the big apocalypse that happened to humanity. I won't spoil anything, these games are best played blind, but there's definitely a good bit here in terms of backstory and lore to find and piece together. So I'd say definitely give it a try if you want to play it for the lore, but definitely stay for the story because the lore here, it's interesting, there are a lot of little secret things to find a lot of secrets to piece together and there are a decent amount of them but i think the story shines more than the lore here but that's just me now the next game i played last year is a game that i've talked about in the past cyberpunk 2077 the link to my video on why it's worth playing which basically has my whole review on the game uh, is in the description so i won't spend much other words on it other than it was a good game and it suffers from a reputation and it definitely didn't launch in the hottest capacity, but it's good. And it's definitely worth playing for the story and the gameplay. And in terms of lore, well, considering it's an entirely established universe, it has books and comics about it. And uh, how it's called, tabletop RPGs, which also has a lot of lore in their handbooks. And the entire world inside the game is filled with data shards and little and big mysteries that all seem connected, but it's up there for the player to piece together. Well. It's an absolute no-brainer if you want to play it for lore, so play this game for lore, play this game for gameplay, just just play it, man. It has a bad reputation, but it's so good. Okay, next game. Now, the next game that I played was Elden Ring. Oh, Elden Ring. Many people's game of the year of 2022, and considering I love Dark Souls 1, 3, and Demon Souls, never played 2, I expected it to be my favorite game of the entire year, and yet I started it up, I defeated the first boss without much trouble, I explored the first castle, tried to get into the lore, and I just wasn't feeling it. It was the first game of the year, albeit not the last one, where I absolutely just not feel aligned with the rest of the community as everybody seemed to love this game, and it even got game of the year and so many people loved it. Yet, I did not enjoy playing it and I just felt bored almost the entire time for some reason. I mean, I can see it's a good game, I see it's well designed and I get excited when I hear other people tell me things about how great the game is and how great their experience was and yet I absolutely did not feel the hype train at all. So, yeah, I know the game is good, I'm not gonna tell you it's trash, it is good. I know the lore is deep and almost as amazing as Dark Souls' lore, which I love. And yet, it just didn't do anything for me. Uh, still, I can recommend giving it a try if you like Souls-like games and open world. And if you love lore, as so many people did love it. And my opinion is probably just an ugly outlier, so try it if you like. Nothing for me, unfortunately. But yeah, I did have high expectations for Elden Ring, but in the end, it turned out that it took the Demon Souls PS5 remake to scratch my phone from soft itch, so the Souls-like itch. Uh, this game is probably the most, or at least one of the most beautiful games that I've ever seen graphically. And it's a good Soulsborne game at that. It's actually, I believe, the first in the series. I can be saying something weird now. So, yeah, if you like Soulsborne more like Dark Souls and not like an open world game, give that a try. Uh, it's really good, and just like Dark Souls and Elden Ring, it has a confusing yet satisfying lore to explore once you get the full picture. 
or at least try to get the full picture so yeah give it a try definitely worth playing um, people know what Dark Souls is about so I don't think I need to explain it now talking about games that other people loved and I didn't Xenoblade Chronicles 3 I will be short about this game the gameplay was good the story I did not love and the lore is not that deep that might be too short so I love Xenoblade as a series. I love Xenoblade 1, 2, Torna, Future Connected, and I did not try Xenoblade Chronicles X because the first level um, was pretty good, but I had other games to play, so yeah. Anyway, it's fair to say that I was pretty hyped that we would get a third mainline game because this wasn't my first Xenoblade Rodeo, and I was ready. But man, I really did not enjoy the game as much as others. Other people online keep touting it as the best ever Xenoblade game, but I just kind of found it mediocre. Uh, these games are absolutely worth playing blind, so I won't go into any of the details of the story, because the story, despite my dislike of it in this game, is still one of the main reasons to play it, so I won't spoil it. But I just found the story to be lacking with its own internal logic, sometimes just not being there and cohesion being weird. The enemies, in my opinion, were mostly shallow, although there were some good ones. Now, the traditional Xenoblade humor was kind of lacking, as there were funny moments with far less than in the other games. And the world, the gorgeous open world, was just empty. It's gorgeous and it has a lot to it, but the world is just so empty to me. There is a story reason as to why all these monsters, ruins and small little camps are there instead of cool cities and infrastructure everywhere around the world. But I love the world of Xenoblade Chronicles 2, for example, where there were grand cities and many settlements, all with their own feel and distinct identities and nations and countries. And this just kind of felt off to me. Like, you can see a certain amount of little camps with the same kind of buildings and eventually just get bored of them. I mean, those were the reasons why I did not enjoy this game as much as I would have liked, as I played this game for, you know, quite a while. But usually I just play these games for the awesome open worlds and the amazing stories and the very on point humor, which can be a tad cringe for some people, but to me are just the perfect blend of serious story and comedic relief moments. But another reason that I play these games are the great and deep characters, and in that department Xenoblade Chronicles 3 did succeed. The characters and the side characters are all pretty amazing, and for the first time in Xenoblade history, the English voice acting is on par with the Japanese voice acting, so that's a plus and the characters absolutely make this story and they shine with their backstories and just the way they are you know what also shines in this game you know what also effing shines the combat oh boy it's honestly the best battle system that a xenoblade game has had so far in my opinion it takes the best from all the previous games and meshes it together in an awesome way i mean it honestly is the first time i truly enjoyed a xenoblade combat and that says something, as in the previous games I either hated it or I tolerated it and only went through it because the enjoyable story is enjoyable enough for me to plow through it. So yeah, it isn't all bad for me. The game has amazing characters, some of the best in the series, and they make the somewhat lackluster story at least a decent story to experience. And the combat is really amazing. Oh, and I guess the open world design is also really good. but. The lack of cities and major settlements really drags it down for me, but, you know, the environments are really beautiful. If only the Switch could render it, you know, higher than 720p. So, it's definitely not a game for everybody, and if you really want to go in for any lore exploration, you're really better off with Xenoblade Chronicles 2 and its prequel standalone DLC, uh, Xenoblade Chronicles 2 Torna, the Golden Country, as that's the most fleshed out game or other games in the series in terms of world building and lore with deeper mysteries about the world to learn and world building points to discover and uh, those two games went away Xenoblade Chronicles 2 and then it's a standalone DLC uh, Torna both take place in the same world so yeah you learn about that same world because all of that is just a bit lackluster in 3 but if you like yourself some enjoyable JRPG mechanics and beautiful environments and an actually good English dub give it a try but in my opinion, if you never played Xenoblade and want the best world to explore and the most lore to think about, 2 is your best option, even if the combat is definitely better in 3. Oh boy. Next game! And the next game is The Forgotten City. I have a lot of feelings about this game. It's not lore heavy, as it's a sort of historical and myth fiction. I really, really don't want to spoil anything, as this is probably the game in this list which is absolutely crucial you know nothing about prior to experiencing it to have the best experience 
All that I can say is, well, you are someone who gets dropped in an ancient Roman city in like um, 59 AD or something, if I remember it correctly. There's a mystery in the city as people there have to live with some sort of weird rule or other condition attached to their lives and you need to solve it. This game makes some of the most accurate historical references that I've often seen in games and it nails a lot of the ancient mythology pretty well and the view of the local peoples on mythology. The narrative is pretty damn good and it has some good characters, not a lot of lore, but a lot of interesting accurate historical facts in an interesting mystery game which explores mythology. It basically started out as a Skyrim mod of all places and only then became an actual game. So you could just try the Skyrim mod for free as it's apparently the same story, sort of. But the standalone game just works better and I really recommend trying it, you know, to just support the developers of this awesome game. It's definitely, you know, in my top three of games of the last year. Give it a try or watch a playthrough if it sounds like your kind of thing. So I have been positive about the last game. So now I need to bitch about the game again. So God of War Ragnarok. Get this picture. I got a PS4 in 2020. In the last year of that console's life, I basically just played most of all the PlayStation exclusives that I missed over the years during the lockdown. I mean, what else to do when you're shot inside? Now, one of my favorites of those games back then was the original God of War reboot. It was pretty amazing. Good story, good combat, nice exploration of Norse mythology, even though I heard it wasn't 100% accurate. Good stuff, amazing time. So yeah, you can say that I was just a little bit hyped for God of War Ragnarok, the direct sequel. But then I just played it for a few hours and I just stopped. The gameplay loop, which is basically a story cutscene and exploration. Fight some enemies before you can continue with exploration. Story cutscene and then exploration. Fight some enemies before you can continue. Uh, that gameplay loop, it just really didn't work for me anymore and I was bored. Then I went back to the original and I had that same boredom. So I just think that the lockdown made me a bit more open to games I would have otherwise not been able to play. And I'm kind of grateful for that as I have such amazing memories of the original God of War. But then the gameplay loop really doesn't work for me anymore for some reason. Despite getting really hooked on the story. I just couldn't do it anymore to the point where I played a couple of hours. And then a couple of hours in I... I just couldn't do it anymore. I don't know. I mean, once again, the story was great. Uh, the Norse mythology was fun to learn about, even though, again, not all of it's accurate. The characters were amazing. Combat felt much more fluid than the first game, so it's good. It's a really good game. My friend, who really rarely completes any game 100%, 100% of this game because it was just so good for him. And I know it's a good game, but it just really didn't work for me. Elden Ring 2, basically. I know it's a good game, it just didn't work for me. I am sorry. Still, it's really worth playing the first game and this one. If you want to know something about Norse mythology, I don't really know if I should call it mythology or lore, because they did have a lot of creative freedom with Norse mythology. Like, it's not super accurate, so I think I'd call it lore. Like, if you want to explore that kind of thing, God of War Ragnarok, definitely worth playing. And God of War the original, also definitely worth playing. Unfortunately, the gameplay loop really just doesn't work for me anymore, so that's kind of a shame. Anyway, same goes for the next game. No Man's Sky. Now, I know that this game has a reputation for a faulty launch, but I heard from all sides that this game has become pretty amazing. It has some cool lore in it to explore about the universe and the different factions, but that's all hearsay. I was really excited to try it when the Switch board came, because I had a long road trip and nothing but time. And I was about to go on that road trip and I was like, yes, this is my game for this road trip. But then the gameplay loop of just collecting resources and a lot of scanning just really didn't work for me. To be fair here, I only got a few hours in, maybe only like two hours. And I'm planning to give the game another try when I'm in the mood for some space exploration. Because I heard really good things about this game, but my first try it really didn't work out for me, unfortunately. But I'm still mentioning it here because... I did hear that there was some good lore in it, I just haven't found it myself yet because I haven't started it. So, you know, maybe some of you in the comments can tell me if it's even worth starting up again for that reason. Alright, let's do some more positivity. I replayed Uncharted 4 last year and that game does work for me. Solving puzzles, historical fiction, dry humor sometimes, and the story. And it just wraps up the entire Uncharted you know, story from all the previous games. 
I don't really have a lot to say to be honest, it was just an amazing experience. Gameplay is great, there's no real lore, uh, but it's a pretty short game that doesn't overstay its welcome and really wraps up the series in a satisfying way. Now, the real reason that I'm bringing up Uncharted, despite not really having anything to say on the game, is because of the next game I played. Stray, or as I call it, Cat Uncharted. It's basically Uncharted, but you play as a cat. And now, you can meow using a dedicated meow button. It's honestly full of amazing puzzles and it has a big mystery you solve in the game as to what happened to humanity as you come in a completely abandoned post-apocalyptic city which you explore as a cat and you encounter the robots that humanity left behind which have formed their own, you know, artificial intelligence-like civilization. It's a really charming game. It's not very long, just like Uncharted, it does not overstay its welcome and it goes for quality over quantity. As every moment of this game is a treat and I really just straight up feels like Uncharted, but as a cat. It's pretty amazing, there isn't really a lot of lore, but the feeling of piecing together what happened to humanity using all sorts of clues has that same feeling of researching a lore mystery and trying to find the answer, so... If anything, this game tells a lot of its story through the environment, which really is a pro for the world builders of this game because it has an amazing world it's pretty amazing and i really recommend giving it a try so um yeah enough positivity pokemon scarlet now most of you by now know that i grew up on pokemon and that i still enjoy playing it although my relationship with the series is complicated i am a casual gamer all the way and yet i find myself really not enjoying a lot of modern pokemon I always give it a try, but the oversimplification of some parts of the gameplay loop, while convenient for playing, it just ceases to give me the nostalgia itch that I look for, because I play Pokemon for the nostalgia. All cards on the table here, save for some horrendous performance issues at launch, this is probably the best Pokemon game in years, or so some of my friends who are way more into the series than I am have told me. But Again, all cards on the table, I just want to go back to the time as a kid when I had to go to the PC to take out Pokemon when the Pokemart and Poke Center were just separate buildings which I had to find where the story was simple but to the point. I mean, this may just no longer be the series for me because this game is just far better than any Pokemon game that came before but it just doesn't scratch my nostalgia itch anymore. So, yeah. If you enjoy Pokemon, not for the nostalgia, but for the gameplay, well, it's the best main series game in a long while, I have heard. Even if I didn't get very far in the game, many of the quality of life improvements the players who are not like me have been screaming about for years are here. And it's non-linear and open world, what else do you want? Well, I want some nostalgia. And the games give me that less and less, but yeah, I recognize it's a good game. The best of the main Pokemon series in years, according to many. It just hasn't those things that I am personally looking for in a Pokemon game. But let's be honest, as a 23 year old whose glory days were Pokemon Silver on my Game Boy Color and Pokemon Diamond on my DS, and looks for those days to return, I am just not the target audience for this game. And that's okay. That said, I am the target audience for the spin-off Pokemon Legends Arceus which launched at the beginning of the year. So much nostalgia, so much old music, renewed battle system, many old characters from generation 4 that basically are reused as our sort of ancestor figures. Basically my bread and butter. And this game has an art style which makes the game look like an old Japanese painting. I mean, did I even mention the music? Yes, I know I did. But man, music makes me a Pokemon game and it has so many references to the old gen 4 games in its music. You know, that shit was my childhood. So yeah, this game, which many people told me is a bit simple, be it a fun concept, but completely relying on nostalgia, did work for me because I, for just a few fleeting moments, I kind of felt like Young Zork again exploring a Pokemon game on my Game Boy for the very first time again. So yeah, good stuff. Play that if you're like me and want nostalgia. Now, you know what's good shit, but without the good part? Guard 3. This game, a PS3 exclusive after the PS4 already launched, never got ported. But a friend of mine told me that if I enjoyed Nier Automata, I had to play Guard 3 as that was made by the same director and has a similar feel. It isn't. It really isn't, as it is not to me. I know some people enjoy this game. I watched some cutscenes online after I play, stopped playing and the story and characters are kinda charming, but please don't make the mistake I did and buy this game. I'm not even gonna say it's a good game, that I recognize it's a good game. 
it's just bad. It runs horribly on the PS3 with frame drops everywhere. And just remember, it's available nowhere else. Not on the PS4, not on the PS5, nowhere. And the gameplay itself is either tolerable at best or just straight up annoying at worst. At least half the game is just self-aware as the characters tend to say stuff like Wait, do we really have to do this? Isn't that super annoying? And then you shout at your screen, Yes, it is super annoying! I saw a comment under a video which uh, was a review of this game which basically agreed with me and that comment said that it is an 8 out of 10 game that decided to be bad and be a 3 out of 10 game. And that's really an accurate summary. Do not try to play just just go for a cutscene compilation and you will honestly be doing yourself a favor. But there is some charm to it. But no, there isn't, because I'm not even done complaining about this game. You know, while I was playing this game, my girlfriend sat beside me while I was playing, I was playing this game. Brad's Fashion Something. It's a game about fashion, and Drake Guard 3's game's performance issues and annoying gameplay wanted me to take her Switch and play her game instead. I gave Drake Guard 3 a try, it's not worth it, story was fun though, watch a cutscene compilation if you want to see some of that Yoko Taro writing, I really don't know what else to say. So a game that probably none of you will care hearing about is Formula 1 Manager 2022. You see, I love myself some Formula 1, as a physics teacher the aerodynamics of these machines are just super interesting, racing is a close second. But you guys also know by now that I have the reaction time of a rusted tea kettle, so I've never really succeeded at playing the games where you race yourself. So this game seemed like an amazing compromise for someone like me. I mean, I was able to make Sebastian Vettel the 2022 Formula 1 world champion in a Ferrari. What else does humanity need? But yeah, it was enjoyable. But the fact that there are quite some bugs in this game, some realism missing and some lackluster support from the developers with updates kind of drags the experience down. I don't know if they will make another manager game. I guess if they do, 2023 manager will fix a lot of the problems of this one. As it was their first game and they said that they moved on to other projects. So yeah, I wa it was enjoyable, but definitely not realistic with the problems that it has. So yeah. I think you're best off waiting until they make a 2023 game, just so a lot of the problems are fixed. But considering Seb Vettel retired this year, it is your last chance to make him a champion, so make it count. Now, another game that I really enjoyed, so far at least, is Persona 5 Royal. I bought it a while back and I decided to finally give it a try, literally on the 31st of December. And since then, I've played it on and off and only just now I'm really gearing up to properly play it. It's one of the better turn-based RPGs that I've played, but for a full-on review, well, wait until it's January or February of 2024 when I cover the game that I played that in 2023. Uh, all I can say now is that I don't really know about lore yet. It uh, doesn't seem like there's a lot of it since it's basically set in a parallel version of our current Earth where there are basically people who have these personas. Um, so yeah, not a lot of lore it seems so far. Can't really say anything about it other than the characters are really charming, story is pretty charming so far, and uh, gameplay is pretty good. So, yeah, kind of makes me think of uh, Fire Emblem Three Houses because it has this whole time management thing, um, which is a little deeper than Three Houses actually. Anyway, those were the games that I played in 2022. I really hope that you enjoyed hearing my stupid opinions on them, and you will probably disagree with all of them. Zork out.